Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Tim Poe, Director of Telehealth with the UNC Cancer Network, and I'd like to welcome you to this special presentation, Oral Cancer, a Comprehensive Overview. Uh, bear with us for just one moment. We lost our content. We're going to share that back out, and we'll have that with you in just a moment here. <clears throat> there we go. All right, so we've got, you, you should be seeing our, our main slide again. This is a co-presentation of the UNC Cancer Network and the UNC School of Dentistry, and we're very excited about presenting in coordination with the School of Dentistry today. One more minor adjustment I need to make, and there we go. All right, if you are having any technical difficulties at all, please call us right away, 919-445-1000. Again, that's 919-445-1000. Don't wait. Any technical difficulties, give us a call. We're going to use Poll Everywhere. We'll talk about that in a moment. You can find us on the web at unccn at unc.edu. We're on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube as well. All right. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is, is talk about Poll Everywhere. This will be your opportunity to let our presenters know who you are, what your background is briefly. And so we'll be doing that in just a moment. And then uh, after we introduce our presenters and go into the presentation, you can be jotting down questions. And then at the very end, you'll be able to use the same Poll Everywhere tool to submit your questions at the end. So you go if you're at a computer and would like to use Poll Everywhere, you just go to pollev, P-O-L-L-E-V dot C-O-M forward slash U-N-C-C-N, and you can go ahead and see the questions as they appear there. If you are on a phone, you're going to dial the number 22 or text the number 22333 and put in the letters U-N-C-C-N. Only need to do that one time today. You'll get a little message back that says join, and then you're joined to our Poll Everywhere session. You can go ahead and answer this question and then start texting in your questions for the presentation. Uh, when, when we get to the end of the presentation, you can text in your questions. So uh, what, which best describes you? If you are a dentist, you can go ahead and put in A. If you're a dental assistant, you can go ahead and put in B. If you're a registered nurse or advanced practice registered nurse, you can go ahead and put in C. If you are a radiologic technologist, go ahead and put in D. If you're a doctor of medicine or a doctor of osteopathic medicine, please put in E. And any, any other background, you can go ahead and put in F for other. So again, A for DDS, B for DA. C for RN, APRN. Uh, oh, I, and I beg your pardon, that the, the DA is actual, actually dental hygienist. So thank you. Uh, so this uh, D for, for the radiologic technologist, E for MD or DO, and F for other. All right. We are very pleased to have Trevor Hackman, MD and FACS, Associate Professor, Director of Transoral Surgery Program at the UNC School of Medicine, and also to have Ricardo J. Padilla, DDS, Clinical Associate Professor, Department of Diagnostic Sciences, UNC School of Dentistry, and also Samip Patel, MD, FACS, Assistant Professor, Head and Neck Oncology, Microvascular Reconstruction, UNC School of Medicine. Gentlemen, welcome, all of you. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And uh, let's go look at that poll and see who we have. All right. We've got a lot of dentists. Looks like the lion's share so far. Dentists, um, <coughs> dental hygienists, uh, RNAPRN. And we'll wait just a few more seconds. If you have not yet had an opportunity to respond to this poll, please go ahead and do so now. And again, uh, this really helps our presenters know, know about our audience today. And then also, you're good to go at this point when it comes to asking questions uh, at the end of the presentation. We have a lot to cover, so we'll go ahead and move on. But gentlemen, that gives you a sense of uh, who, who we have attending today. Welcome, everybody. All right, I do have a disclosure statement. This activity is planned and implemented under the sole supervision of Thomas Shea, MD, the course director in association with the Office of Continuing Professional Development. Thomas Shea, MD, consults for Spectrum Pharma and receives research support from Millennium, Atsuka, GSK, BMS, Novartis, 
and Seattle Genetics. CPD staff have no financial relationships with commercial interests. The speakers, Trevor Hackman, MD, FACS, Ricardo J. Padilla, DDS, and Samip N. Patel, MD, FACS, do not have any financial relationships with commercial interests. And with that in mind, I'll turn it over to, to each of you in turn. Oral cancer, a comprehensive overview. And uh, Dr. Padilla, there's the... Uh, Thank you, team. The, the, uh, if you need the, uh, the cursor and then for advancing the slides. Perfect. Uh, first of all, thank you for the opportunity. And we would like to tell our audience that this presentation is very packed with data and information. Some of it we may not have time to present at this moment. And the slides will be available for you to review after this presentation. So if we skip some areas here and there, Rest assured, you're going to have access to that information eventually. I wanted to start with the definition of oral cancer. In a broad perspective, oral cancer is multiple diseases uh, under that same topic. The majority, between 85 and 90 percent of the cancers that occur in the oral cavity are squamous cell carcinomas, but occasionally we will encounter metastasis to the mouth or tumors of salivary glands lymphomas, leukemia, sarcomas, odontogenic malignancies, and others. But we're going to focus on squamous cell carcinoma. That is the main emphasis of this talk. And as you remember from your days in school, the oral mucosa is lined by stratified squamous epithelium. When these keratinocytes on the basal cell layer of the epithelium become neoplastic, they have a tendency to lose control of their proliferation of the cell cycle. And they start making themselves a clone of each other and then you develop a lesion in the epithelium. There's uh, a biology to the, each specific side of the, of the mouth, and not all parts are the same. So dysplasia that originates in keratinized mucosa is a little bit different biologically than the dysplasia that originates in tonsillar epithelium or non-keratinized epithelium. In the oral, on the oral cavity, we also have some concepts that are slightly different from other sites, which the first is a drop-down carcinoma. Sometimes in the oral cavity uh, neoplastic process, the squamous cell carcinoma may develop much earlier than in other sites, especially in the skin and in the cervix. So there's not necessarily a progression through all the stages of dysplasia and carcinoma in situ before invasion occurs into the connective tissue stroma. Once the invasion starts, uh, it has access, the, the tumor cells have access to lymphovascular spaces and to perineural areas for transitioning into the more distant sites. So essentially when a, when a tumor cell gets into a vessel, it can travel through it as a tumor embolus and lodge itself in a filter down the line, which usually starts with the lymph nodes of the neck and then forward. The other concept that the oral mucosa has a little bit different is the concept of superficial invasive squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, it is relatively earlier than other malignancies in other sites, and in general, oral maxillofacial pathologies have a tendency to call superficially invasive things that in other places will be potentially dysplasia with basal cell hyperplasia. There's also another concept in the oral mucosa that's called proliferative verrucous leukoplakia, and that is a clinical condition. It's not a is not a disease that we can diagnose under a microscope, but it is the correlation between clinical and microscopic uh, information in which a patient may have uh, dysplastic lesions or carcinomatous lesions of multiple sites in the mouth. And that also uh, supports the concept of field cancerization by slaughter back in a few decades ago. So let me show you on the left, on your left there's two panels that show you superficial, superficial or uh, invasive squamous cell carcinoma arising from the surface. On top, let me see if I can use this mouse here. This is nice. We have an island of tumor that has comedial necrosis in the center. In the bottom, you see an island of tumor that has keratin pearls. Those two are good signs of invasion in some in the cases. But notice that in the surface epithelium, there is no carcinoma in situ in this particular photo, yet there is invasive cancer in the connective tissue. Over here to the right, you see tumor islands that are invading in the connective tissue stroma. These tumor islands, as they develop enzyme productions, they invade through the collagen mem uh, 
proteins. And eventually they can gain access, as you see, this green arrow is pointing to striated muscle. And there's two more islands uh, highlighted by blue arrows that are already in the muscle. And also this green, uh, black arrow is showing you a nerve and these two more islands are very close to it. So the concept of invasion is earlier in the oral cavity. As of risk factors, we all already know the concept of tobacco in any form, and it is a dose-dependent um, carcinogen. Also, excessive alcohol tends to induce a, a higher chance, and the coexistence of both is also a problem for oral carcinogenesis. Then for the oral cavity, HPV infection is a relatively lower risk than in the oropharyngeal area. In the oropharynx, somewhere in the neighborhood of 65 to 70 percent of the squamosome carcinomas that arise in that area are HPV driven by transcriptionally active virus. In the oral cavity, is more like between 4 and 6 percent. Immunosuppression and immunodeficiencies also induce the or uh, limit the immunosurveillance of the patient's uh, system to stop neoplastic cells as they arise. So that patients with immunosuppression or immunodeficiency have a higher incidence of this. The exposure to beetle nut, areca nut, or any type of um, product like that, and actinic, actinic damage to the, to the lower lip is also an issue. The gender usually is more common in males, the older the patients, the more chances they have of doing that. Poor nutrition, especially when patients don't have a well-balanced diet rich in, in phytochemicals, they can have a high risk of developing squamosal carcinoma. Patients with immunosuppression, secondary to graft versus host disease. Some, some genetic conditions, and specifically here, Fanconi's anemia, dyskeratosis congenita, and lichen planus. Uh, the reported rate of lichen planus transformation into precancer or cancer is somewhere between 0.5 and 2%, depending on the definition that you have. But that's, uh, those are the risk factors that we have for oral cancer. All right, so uh, my name is Samit Patel. And I, again, thank you for, for your participation. Um, uh, uh, I enjoyed being here and the uh, opportunity to present here. So I'll be talking about um, precancerous and early cancerous oral lesions, and I'll be transitioning that into um, advanced oral cancer, um, oral, oral cavity cancer um, presentation. <clears throat> so precancerous pre oral lesions obviously implies known um, malignant potential and transformation. So it's imperative uh, to be... Um, have a high clinical suspicion for these lesions. Um, you you want to have uh, a plan of action for these lesions, um, whether it's um, therapeutic or, or simply observation. And um, unfortunately, you can't predict what's going to uh, become cancerous or not. So um, these patients ultimately require uh, high level of vigilance to, to ensure proper follow up. Um, and usually, once I see patients um, with a precancerous lesion or a suspicious lesion on clinical examination, I usually tend to follow them until they can prove to me that um, they're not at risk. Um, and so well, I'm just going to go through a series of, um, of clinical diagnoses that we can see, and probably more often than not in, in uh, a private care setting or, or dental um, office rather than my clinic per se. Um, but um, the first one we'll talk about is actinic colitis, known as uh, sailor's lip. And um, the known percentage of transformation rate is about six to ten percent, depending on what literature you read. Um, you know, this obviously is uh, on the sun-bearing portion of the lips, which is the lower lip. Um, generally, affects white men, um, and the vermilion um, becomes atrophic. It's pale, glossy surface, and then you lose the uh, demarcation at the border, and you can get fissuring and ulceration with crusting and scaling. Usually, the crusting and repeated scaling is what what you see in, in, in clinical presentation, you should have a high clinical suspicion on any lesion that, that repeatedly crusts and, and scales over. Um, here you can see the lower left lip, um, pretty classic uh, appearance. And you can see it basically uh, looks crusted over and pale. You're going to start losing the definition and some, some ulceration here in the central portion. 
So what do you do? Uh, you, you could biopsy this lesion, you could excise it. Um, options are topical 5-FU, which um, a lot of dermatologists can use for skin cancer, um, early skin cancers, um, prophylactic laser ablation, or just removing the entire vermilion uh, surface and close long-term follow-up. So if you can see, if you go back to this picture, where do you biopsy? You can take representative biopsies. You, can, you, know, you may miss the cancer if there is an underlying cancer because it can be in one area versus the other, but you know, this would be a good, um, a good uh, example of just excising this area uh, completely to know the definitive diagnosis. Leukoplakia is obviously very common, known as a white patch. Most of you know it can be asymptomatic. Um, it cannot be rubbed off. Uh, technically, these should be biopsied. You know, I've seen anywhere from up to 20% may exhibit dysplasia of carcinoma. It seems high, but I guess the underlying um, uh, importance of this is that um, you should rule out cancer. Now, in my training, I was always told that if it's a leukoplakia in a smoker drinker, that's more suspicious. Uh, but really, recently, I've read literature showing that patients that don't have that those risk factors may be even more increased risk for for uh, carcinoma uh, if if these lesions should be uh, should appear. Most, most show to be chronic inflammation on biopsy, and the most common locations are the ventral or lateral tongue or floor mouth, but can be seen anywhere throughout the upper air digestive tract. And here you have an example of the lateral bore of the tongue here and the buccal, uh, buccal mucosa. Um, a proliferative vericus uh, leukoplakia, that Dr. Padilla uh, mentioned, this is, this is really a tricky um, <coughs> disease and really um, uh, you don't want to underestimate this this. Um, process. It's a very high rate of malignant uh, change. They have thick, exophytic, and it can be flat in the early stages, obviously. Um, I've seen it in the buccal mucosa. You can have it on the end, as well as the gingiva. And women, um, primarily 50 years of age or older, um, present with this. Slow growing, and it's multifocal, which is really the, the issue. Um, and the treatment of choice would be if you can excise it completely, but it can be difficult. If you look here, oral tongue, you have a multifocal uh, lesion here. So where, where do you biopsy? What do you excise? This would be a pretty pretty large resection. And, and if, you, if it's just um, a benign process, then you, you look at skin grafting it. You may have to come back and um, do a further resection if you if you uh, confirm cancer, which would be a, a pretty large resection. Again, same with this lower picture, multifocality. And this one definitely looks much uglier than, than the, the previous one. And then here again, on the lateral oral tongue here. <clears throat> uh, tobacco pouch keratosis, um, direct effect of smokeless tobacco. It's a form of leukoplakia. Uh, lesion occurs at the site of contact, so you see it in the anterior labial vestibule, buccal vestibule. It basically looks like a wrinkled pouch um, and a depression where, where the tobacco is held. Um, and you can see here kind of leathery appearance. Um, you know, this is pretty common, especially in North Carolina. You have a lot of um, smokeless tobacco users, and, you know, I guess surveilling these patients um, is important just because they're at risk of developing oral cavity cancer with their continued use of tobacco. Um, some more rare um, findings here in North Carolina, um, oral submucose, uh, submucosal fibrosis, it should say, um, chronic inflammation, atrophy, and fibrosis of the epithelial lining, and uh, related to the beetle nut. Uh, which is a carcinogen, and, and also there's a beetle leaf, which in the Indian population, you, you wrap the beetle nut with the beetle leaf and, um, and, and along with some tobacco. So you, I haven't seen it much here in North Carolina, um, in Toronto, in places of um, you know, ethnicity, um, and in Indian users, you can see that pretty, pretty commonly. And they present with significant trismus, so it can be very hard to diagnose as well um, if there is a transformation for cancer. Um, anywhere from 4 to 13 percent uh, transformation rate. And here you can see it on the, on the lip, but traditionally it's, it's described on the buccal mucosa, and, um, and it's usually bilateral, and so they can this, uh, develop significant uh, trismus and bilateral cancers. Erythroplakia, flat red area, um, bright red velvety appearance. This is pretty obvious, and uh, high incidence of uh, dysplasia and carcinoma. So, uh, biopsy versus the excisional biopsy, if you can do it, um, is mandatory. Here you go, pretty pretty classic appearance here. And <clears throat> oral lichen planus, uh, this along with the proliferative um, uh, leukoplakia, uh, I kind of group these two together. Very high risk patients, um, especially in uh, women, non-smokers, um, 
can can progress to cancer uh, pretty quickly, actually. If uh, and so these patients in my in my practice undergo um, close surveillance and uh, usually require a lot of biopsies just to make sure you're not missing a cancer, because when they present, it can really look look like a clinical cancer. I've been fooled a couple of times, um, only to for the cancer to progress eventually. Um, but women. 1% of the adult population, like Dr. Padilla said, about 1% uh, risk of um, a malignancy associated with it. And there's three types in general, reticular, erythematous, and erosive. And I'll show you the first first area here is a reticular um, appearance. You have an erythematous appearance, and then you have um, the ulcerative appearance here. And they, they can this can present anywhere. The entire oral cavity can be um, involved and can fluctuate in, in, in presentation. So as we transition to early cancers, obviously early detection um, is directly res uh, results in improved survival and uh, tobacco use and habitual alcohol consumption are the main risk factors. Uh, unlike other places in the air digestive tract, this is fairly accessible um, for screening, but more so more symptomatic um, than other places. You know, small cancers can be very painful and usually this is the most common reason why a patient seek care. So, but. Um, Despite that, delayed diagnosis still occurs, um, and so you need to be vigilant about screening if you can. Um, 14, early oral cancers, 14% of all head and neck cancers, mean presentation is about 64 years of age, male predominance, and squamous cell carcinoma is obviously the most common um, um, pathology. And, you know, at the time of diagnosis, 55% of patients have early stage lesions. And when we really when we talk about oral cavity, there is some confusion even among um, you know our medical um, colleagues of what defines oral cavity and what's oral pharynx. But literally, um, generally anything anterior to the heart palate soft palate junction um, and the circumvallate papilla, anterior to that represents the oral oral cavity. So the retromolar trigone, um, and alveolus, floor mouth, oral tongue. Where the soft palate, the base of tongue and tonsils, that's that's the oral pharynx. A different does different uh, side of disease and represents different disease pathology. And we'll, we'll move to advanced disease and metastasis and I kind of went through the, the subsites and you can see it, see cancers arise everywhere. Um, but it's, it's really important to get a good physical examination because although most uh, cancers are, are very painful, um, even um, the advanced stage cancers you think would be uh, very painful, sometimes they can be Painless, and until you look at all the all the sur surface areas, it, it can be missed. And we talk about um, as cancers uh, advance in the head and neck, um, we look at the drainage, the lymphatic drainage pattern, and you know for the uh, anterior oral cavity and lip, we talk about the anterior neck and the subventum and the sub uh, sub mandibular regions, the, and the facial nodes here, and then we talk about the post more posterior mucosally uh, base lesions along the floor mouth and uh, tongue. Uh, they travel to the lateral neck, um, the jugular diastric along the internal jugular vein, as well as the anterior neck. And so a lot of patients can present, and um, not necessarily with an oral cavity complaint, but with a neck mass. And um, it's easy to see why. Um, so it's so uh, vascularly and lymphovascularly rich. And a um, you know, common presentation is a high level one, which represents this region or level two, the upper neck, a high level one or two neck mass that uh, can be pain, painless as well. Um, <clears throat> and depending on the subsite, you know, the symptoms of, uh, of these oral cavity lesions can be just as simple as mouth fitting of the dentures, um, especially in elderly um, uh, patients with superficial, seeming superficially uh, seeming lesions. Um, that's pretty common. Obviously, dysphagia, pain, ulcers. <coughs> Uh, otalgia, we talked about trismus and bleeding, you know, weight loss. Facial numbness is something that's going to present with an advanced stage lesion as it, as it has involvement of the, um, the trigeminal nerve. And I'll, I'll, and I'll leave you with this uh, case of, of mine who, uh, unfortunately, a um, middle-aged man um, presented with a, a neck mass and uh, was treated on the outside with thought to be a, uh, an abscess. And so it was IND, and obviously this was a facial facial lymph node. So up at the level one region along the jaw, and uh, this obviously progressed. His primary site was the floor of mouth, and uh, not uncommonly do we see this. So he required primary surgical um, disease, uh, surgical treatment, 
large composite resection, meaning we take bone and soft tissue and left them with essentially a hemi, um, hemi mandible defect. And so we traditionally, that's the specimen, you can see the tumor is going to be on the in internal side and the lymph node on the external side. And, um, you know, and Dr. Tackman will talk to you about more about uh, therapy, but, you know, we, we would proceed with reconstructing the mandible with the, what we call a free flap and uh, the soft tissue component to realign his internal mouth with the muscle and the skin to realign his um, uh, external component. And you can see the muscle in place, and then this is the final product here. Excellent. Uh, so we're going to keep on moving through. We thank you for keeping attention. Uh, we've got quite a few slides left. I'll try and hit the, the high points for our audience. We're going to go on to diagnostic and staging. Most important thing within diagnosis and staging that you've all been taught is history and physical exam. There are some ancillary tests listed below that can be helpful, but that's the main uh, function is, is history and physical exam for diagnosis. Uh, Dr. Padilla and Dr. Patel have hit on this. We think about catching patients early. How do we catch them? Non-healing ulcers, erythropoietic lesions, tooth mobility, bleeding, swelling are early signs. When we start to see patients with oral numbness from lingual nerve involvement, tongue restriction from extrinsic tongue muscle involvement, tongue weakness from hypoglossal involvement, trismus from pterygoid involvement, these are more advanced stage lesions that have been there for a while. And Letley had some of these earlier symptoms that then were ignored or not reported and developed these more advanced uh, lesions that will cause more difficulty with speech and swallowing, airway obstruction, and also have a higher risk of adenopathy. There are a number of screening tests out on the market, and here listed below is a sniff, uh, snapshot of some of them uh, published in the journal in, in Head and Neck Oncology in 2011. The one that probably we use the most as head and neck surgeons is toluidine blue, but again, we're not using it as a diagnostic test to find cancer. As you can see where I've highlighted, the, the most effective use of toluidine blue in my practice is if somebody comes in with, as Dr. Patel showed, a very diffuse uh, lesion and you're trying to figure out where to biopsy using the stain where its tissues are more tissues are more readily picking up the stain there's a higher nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio the methylene blue the top so toluene blue may help to sort of pinpoint the most high risk area in that larger lesion to biopsy and it also can be helpful for mapping out the periphery of a lesion to see sort of do you have appropriate margins because even grossly by visual eye Mucosa may look normal, but may have some histologic or microscopic abnormalities. And either using toluidine blue, or as I'll talk about later, frozen sections are important. The sensitivity and specificity of toluidine blue is actually quite high. Uh, and so it is a good adjunct for biopsy uh, and for margin definition. There are some laser-based technology, light laser-based technologies that are out in the market, Visilite, Veloscope, Oroscopic DK, and there's some other ones. They're commercially available. Uh, they are heavily marketed to a lot of dental practices. They're usually not covered by insurance, and they work on the premise that abnormal tissue will have a different reflective or absorbance property for light. And the challenge is that there's no efficacy of these products proven in the literature, and in fact, they're not sold as a diagnostic tool. And because they're not labeled as a diagnostic tool, they've never had to, had to prove efficacy or sensitivity or specificity in detecting lesions. And so the bottom line is that a definitive test requires examination of the cells themselves as opposed to using these ancillary techniques. So they are not a great screening tool for the oral cavity. If you have a lesion that is very suspicious, tissue analysis is still much better. And there's a recent meta-analysis analyzing these different products that showed uh, no efficacy in screening for oral cavity cancer. Uh, brush biopsy is one that's been used every once in a while. Uh, this is an exfoliative technique where a uh, rigid brush sort of scrapes the full thickness of the mucosa. Most of the brush biopsy tests that were done showed benign tissue. However, if you've got somebody who has a mouth where you really can't figure out where to start biopsy, if the brush biopsy were to show some dysplastic tissue, that may point you towards doing excisional biopsies in that area. It's not often used. It's not a popular technique. It does require some additional equipment. Here are some of those technologies, the Veloscope up top, Visilite on the top right, uh, the brush biopsy. Uh, those are the technologies out there, but again, the efficacy for them uh, is not there, and they do come at an extra cost for your patients. 
the standard of care has always been and probably always will be until we get better molecular genetics, biopsy. And for myself and for Dr. Tell and for our head and neck colleagues, we prefer incisional biopsy, uh, provided that it includes the submucosa so you can actually assess, and Dr. Padilla can look at it and tell you whether there's invasion to the deeper tissues. Just a surface mucosal biopsy may not be enough because you may miss the ability to call invasion. So it needs to be at least a full thickness biopsy. And leaving part of the lesion behind is very helpful because for the treating surgeon who gets sent a patient after excisional biopsy with a healed wound that you can't really see where it was and the biopsy margins were positive, now you're chasing microscopic disease, you're chasing what you can't see. So in our minds, an incisional biopsy does the trick. If the lesion is small enough and an excisional biopsy is sort of where you're leaning towards because the lesion is small, would recommend that you take the lesion with grossly normal mucosal margins, so increase your resection specimen, and also consider frozen section technology, toileting blue, some other aspects, so as to minimize the problem of having a positive margin on the final pathology, that then you're deciding whether to chase that margin or not uh, in a healed wound. From a diagnostic imaging standpoint, at, our, at UNC, we favor CT, neck and chest, as a screening tool for our head and neck cancer patients, including oral cavity. So if they have a diagnosis of cancer, we'll recommend typically a CT neck and chest with contrast. The bone definition with CT is excellent. With contrast, the ability to see adenopathy is actually quite good. Most lesions are very visible. And why do we get the chest? Because if we're seeing oral cavity cancer, one, there's a small risk of distant disease, especially if they have adenopathy. But number two is that there's a risk, about 2 to 3% of the population, of having synchronous lesions. And getting the chest CT three months post-treatment, and now we see new nodules, we won't know if they were there before or if they were there at the beginning of treatment. So we always recommend an upfront staging chest CT, both for the risk of synchronous primaries, as well as to sort of get a baseline of what their chest looks like to see if they have distant, distant disease before treatment. The one problem with CT scan is dental artifact. People have a lot of dental amalgam, you'll see that there's a ton of scatter in the area. It makes it very difficult sometimes to assess the primary lesion or sometimes to assess the bone. PET-CT scan is not routinely used by us in the pre-treatment setting, but it can be useful when there's a lot of dental artifact to help map out the tumor. It is more useful in the adjuvant setting or in the very complicated case or if you're concerned about maybe microscopic dis or smaller distant disease. You need about seven millimeters of tissue in a conglomerate to be visible on PET-CT scan. The analogy I give to my patients is that you can't see your house from space with all the lights on, but if everybody in your town or your county turned on their lights, you might see a spot in space. That's the way PET-CT scan works. It can't see an individual cell, but if you get enough of them clustered together and they uptake enough sugar and they're highly, they're more, they're highly enough metabolically active as a group, you may see tumor. So you need about seven millimeters of disease to see that which is why the utility of PET-CT scan is still sort of being figured out in our field. Finally, there's MRI scan. Probably the best place for MRI scan is soft tissue analysis. It's great for looking at the soft tissue definition of the tongue. You'll see there on the lower slide, the MRI scan, even better than CT, can really separate out tumor and different levels of soft tissue planes because the way that magnetic resonance works, you can, you can splice out the, the different absorptive capacities of different soft tissue. So MRI is excellent for working up tongue. It's also excellent for looking at nerve involvement. So if you're worried about lingual nerve involved in the tongue, you're worried about following the nerve to Meckel's cave up in the brain, sort of V2 or V3 involvement, looking at the mandible if you're, if you're curious whether the marrow space or the, or the inferior alveolar nerves involved, and MRI scan can be a useful adjunct test in those areas. Its biggest problem is that the minimum amount of motion leads to a significantly distorted MRI scan. So the acquisition is very long. Patients have a hard time sitting still for it, and so sometimes the motion artifact takes away from the additional information it will give you. The times I use MRI scans in oral cavity are trying to define that soft tissue definition in the tongue or for minor salivary gland malignancies of the oral cavity. It's an excellent tool. From a staging standpoint, not much has changed within the AJCC staging system, which is the staging system that we all sort of use as our reference. For a long time, it's been tumors less than two centimeters are stage one. Tumors that are between two and four centimeters are stage two. And then tumors greater than four centimeters are stage three. And then the stage four disease involves neural involvement, uh, extrinsic tongue muscle involvement, pterygoid involvement, bone involvement. The newest addition in this past iteration of the staging system I've highlighted here is depth of invasion. For years, we reported tumor thickness. 
But the problem with tumor thickness is that there can be an, an exophytic component of the tumor, and then there's an endophytic component of the tumor. If a tumor has a, a centimeter of exophytic growth, that's not going to increase its ris the risk of spread to lymphatics or nerves because it's hanging off of the, the patient's body. It is the depth below the basement membrane. So in this newest iteration, we have changed to depth of invasion as a tool. This was studied and was found that the depth of invasion of greater than five millimeters now is making people stage two. Depth of invasion of more than 10 millimeters with a small primary lesion is now stage three. So our staging systems have changed because we're recognizing that the depth the tumor reaches leads to a higher risk of local recurrence, perineural invasion, and lymphatic spread. And when you have lymph nodes involved in head and neck cancer in general, your survival drops by 50% of what it would have been based on the primary lesion. We've always worked in the premise at UNC that when a tumor is more than four millimeters deep in the floor of mouth or tongue, those patients get a neck dissection. And why? Because the risk of occult metastasis, that means you can't see a lymph node on CT scan, but it's there, it's about 20%. This depth of invasion concept rolls into that, that as you have deeper depth of invasion, there's a higher risk of access of these cancers to the lymphatic system for spread and for spread along nerves as well as lymphatics. The nodal staging system has been about the same. No nodes is N0. One node, you become N1. And again, that now drops you to stage three. And then multiple lymph nodes involved are different iterations of stage two, uh, of, of N2 disease, all of which make you stage four. Here's our staging system overall. The overview of this is to take that once you have nodal involvement, you become stage three, and your survival percentage drop on average by about 50%. So the treatment options. There's destructive technology, laser ablation. As Dr. Patel hinted at, if you've got dysplastic lesions, if you have somebody with field sort of dysplastic changes where excising their whole tongue is just not a practical option, and you've proven they don't have any invasive disease by biopsy, Laser resurfacing is probably appropriate as long as they get routine follow-up. And so I have patients that fit in that category. Excision has always been our gold standard, and until we have something better than excision, which I don't see coming anytime in the near future, it will be our gold standard, with the caveat that you have to estimate approximately a 10 to 5 to 10 millimeter margin because the molecular and histopathologic changes are better than what your eyes can pick up. And so if you think the tissue looks normal, sometimes it's not. I remember early in my career, I had a patient came in with a small floor of mouth carcinoma in situ that had pre previously biopsied and was still residual. It was maybe 10 millimeters in maximum dimension. By the time I was done the operating with him with frozen section, I had extirpated his entire floor of mouth on the right. It looked completely normal. And so you have to be prepared for the fact that it may be more than what you can see. Additional stains can help, such as toluene blue, but frozen section is also very important. Radiation therapy, typically not used in the upfront setting for our patients. It is not standard of care. It's used in the palliative setting if we can't do anything. It's used in patients who are not fit for surgery. Uh, but most of the time when we think about radiation therapy and chemotherapy, we're talking about adjunct therapy vis-a-vis -vis Dr. Patel's case. He just showed you where he took off half the gentleman's neck and face and tongue. That patient has high risk for local recurrence and the only way we're going to help to mitigate that risk is with adjuvant radiation and chemo. Again, gold standard is excision. Knife versus laser versus cautery. There's a decrease in margin preservation. Obviously, the best margin is with a knife. Cautery does take away about two to three millimeters, up to five millimeters of your margin. And so we factor that in when we're taking out lesions to make sure that we don't burn our bridges, if you will, not to make a pun, uh, so that we can excise the lesion completely and, get, and give our pathologist quality tissue to work with. If you give them a charred piece of tissue, they may have a hard time telling you what is dysplastic from cautery effect and what is dysplastic from cancer effect. Uh, again, grossly normal can be abnormal, and just be aware of that. There's transoral laser microsurgery techniques where we divide through the tumor to try and assess the depth and minimize resection. And then there's patients that don't need those con conservative type surgeries, and they need the big open composite resections like Dr. Patel showed you. In our practice at UNC, myself, Dr. Patel, and our, and our partners, when patients have more than a third of their tongue involved, a significant floor of mouth defect, significant buckle or bone exposure, those patients all will get free tissue reconstruction, both from a standpoint of giving them back pliability for restoration of speech and swallowing, 
but also because those patients are at high risk for needing adjuvant radiotherapy and bringing in vascularized healthy tissue allows them to get through that radiotherapy process without the secondary consequences of radionecrosis and tethering and scar tissue and dysphagia and G-tube dependency. Treatment of the bone, you'll see the CT scan on the right. There's an obvious cortical defect in the buccal cortex of the left hemimandible of the body. That's an easy call for myself and Dr. Patel. That patient's getting a segmental mandibulectomy, probably from the ramus to their symphysis. Below in the picture, you'll see an MRI scan that shows enhancement of the uh, bone marrow canal. That also is a definite call for mandibulectomy because we know the marrow space is involved on MRI scan. On, uh, on the maxilla, we have the option of either doing free tissue transfer or obturator. In the mandible, we vote for uh, a free tissue transfer with bone unless there's some uh, significant reason why the patient can't have bony reconstruction. When cancers abut the mandible, but there's no obvious invasion on CT scan or an MRI scan, that's when we lead towards marginal mandibulectomies, taking the upper half or the inner half of the, of the mandible, but saving about a centimeter strut of the mandible, and then sending that tissue off to a pathologist to assess is there bony invasion or not. You have to leave about a centimeter of that mandible. If you don't, then the, the, the bone can pathologically fracture. Sometimes, if it's fairly brittle, you need to reinforce it with a reconstruction bar. In those scenarios, we may do the neck dissection at the time of the marginal mandibulectomy, or if we're not sure about potential bone marrow invasion, we may do that bony part first, not touch the neck, wait for final pathology, because if there is bone invasion, then we're going back and we are doing a resection of the mandible and we're needing that neck for vascular reconstruction. And so operating on it twice may, be, may compromise the, the vitality of our reconstruction. Uh, so those are sort of the thought processes we think about with bone involvement. When it's obvious, it's a segmental. When there's questions, we shave some of the bone for a margin and for better assessment with our pathologist. Those reports typically take about a week because you have to decalcify the bone. From a regional treatment standpoint, as I mentioned earlier, depth of invasion of more than four millimeters increases your risk for occult metastasis to about 20%, meaning that it's not seen on scan, but it could still be there. And so that is our sort of line for when we do uh, neck dissection. For oral cavity, levels one through four, as Dr. Patel had pointed out, he pointed those levels out, one and two are the, the highest levels. Uh, in the neck, and those are the ones that are most at risk, but you can have skip metastasis as low as level four. Uh, for the process of the neck dissection, back in the day, sort of uh, 1920s, 1940s, 1960s, it was more radical neck dissections, taking the jugular vein, the sternocleidomastoid muscle, the spinal accessory nerve, and causing shoulder dysfunction. Nowadays, we've become much more conservative because there's been studies over time showing that resection of these other structures is not necessary unless they are involved. And so most patients will receive a more elective neck dissection, removing the fat and the lymph nodes in these areas, but sparing the muscles, sparing the veins, sparing the nerves. But that being said, these structures are all at risk during surgery, and patients need to be aware of the fact that those structures are at risk. Sentinel node dissection, people ask about this a lot. It is one of the uh, options. It was first uh, described in 1996. But the uh, no, micronodal metastasis is present about 50%, as uh, has been pointed out earlier. But the problem in oral cavity is there are multiple sentinel nodes. And when there are multiple sentinel nodes, it can be hard to see which one is the correct one. It's shown some promise, but nobody has shown in a study that it's useful, so we're still not using it in standard of practice. Adjuvant radiation therapy, when do we use it? We use it when the primary site has a stage 3 or stage 4 lesion, when there's nerve involvement, lymphovascular space invasion, or positive margins, because those patients have risk for recurrence. And then when lymph nodes are involved, that's another reason for radiation therapy because there's a risk of continued lymphatic spread. I tell my patients, think about an analogy to Grand Central Station and train stops around the country. I can take out Grand Central Station, I can take out the train stops, but I can't take out the tracks in between. And that's what we're counting on for radiation therapy when you're talking about treatment in the adjuvant setting to prevent recurrence. Chemotherapy, chemotherapy was studied recently. European and uh, U.S. trials, they looked at would chemotherapy make a difference in stage 3 and stage 4 cancer? There was a European study and there was a U.S. study looking at a, a phase 3 clinical trials of using cisplatin. And what the, the trials basically showed, both in the European trial and the U.S. trial, is that there was improved local regional control in both, and in the U.S. trial there was also an improvement in disease-free survival. With these two trials, chemotherapy became standard of care in addition to radiation 
for the adjuvant treatment of head and neck cancer in the oral cavity advanced stage. So now, this day and age, chemotherapy is indicated if you have positive margins, absolutely, if you have extraneural extension, and it's also recommended if you have stage three, stage four, nerve invasion, lymphovascular space invasion, as Dr. Padilla hit in that earlier, bulky neck disease, or lower neck involvement. Finally, prognostic factors. These have been touched on a little bit earlier. Age greater than 40 has a poor prognosis. Now, interestingly enough, in the last 20 years, we've seen an increasing incidence in squamous cell carcinoma in our younger patients, less than 40. However, fortunate news is those patients, their prognosis appears to still be better than our older population. Systemic illnesses that were touched on before, such as autoimmune diseases and Sjogren's have immune dysregulation. They are at higher risk for recurrence, even with standard of care therapy. Tobacco and alcohol are risk factors for developing cancer, but also are risks for response. There has been a few studies that show that if patients continue to smoke during their radiation therapy, their rate of complete response goes from 74% down to 45%, just because they were smoking during therapy. Which This may be because of the carcinogenic effect, this may be because of the microvascular damage, it's just that it's there. As pointed out by Dr. Padilla earlier, patients with a very non-vegetarian diet, high in neutrosamines and, and low in antioxidants, have a higher risk of cancer as well. From the surgical standpoint, positive margins, lymphovascular space invasion predicts for nodal metastasis as well as recurrence, perineural invasion, which is seen in probably about a half of specimens, predicts local recurrence and nodal metastasis, and then nodal metastasis themselves predict further nodal metastasis. And so these are all negative prognostic factors. And again, you'll see that this list corresponds to the list of who gets adjuvant chemoradiotherapy after surgery. Uh, again, depth of invasion of more than five millimeters, tumors greater than two centimeters, these are all negative prognostic factors that increase the hazard ratio that a patient's going to have recurrence uh, or die of disease. From a molecular standpoint, there's a few molecular markers. P53 has been around for a long time. When people have P53 mutations, which is typically seen in smoking and drinking, there's a 2.4-fold increase in local regional recurrence. When the tumor microvascular density is elevated, there's a higher risk of nodal metastasis. It makes sense. The more access, the more likely for nodal metastasis. When the primaries are cyclin D positive, which can be tested, there's a higher rate of occult metastasis. EGFR was a really hot topic about 10 years ago. When there's overexpression of EGFR, epidermal growth factor receptor, prognosis is poorer and patients are more radioresistant. Cetuximab was developed as an EGFR inhibitor. Interestingly enough, the effectiveness of cetuximab is irrespective of patient's EGFR level. Can't explain that. Um, and then finally, cytokeratin uh, 8 and 18 decreases overall and progression of survival. And interestingly enough, HPV, mostly oral pharyngeal, in the oral cavity, it, is, it doesn't affect female prognosis, but in men, if they're HPV positive, their prognosis is better. Final prognostic factors, distance to treatment. This has been shown time and time again. When patients travel from a far distance, they do poor. Time to treatment. If their treatment is greater than 45 days, they have a higher risk of death. Socioeconomic status, marital status. When patients are widowed, they do poor. And then finally, treatment center. There's a good study that showed that when patients were treated in an academic center, compared to a community cancer center, compared to a community hospital, they did better, even though the patients who were seen in the academic center were seen later, and their time to definitive treatment was longer, their survivals were better. And this may go to both the skill of the, of the, of the practitioners there, but it also may be the also other ancillary supportive strategies, such as tobacco cessation, speech and swallowing, nutrition, that may play a role in those patients' overall survival. So we're going to briefly touch on the complications of anti-neoplastic therapy and without going into much detail about the surgical complications, some of the things that happen to patients after radiation or chemotherapy are mucositis, serostomia, opportunistic infections, increased risk of dental caries, periodontal disease, trismus, fibrosis, pain of any type, difficulty with taste and swallowing, occasionally osteoradionecrosis, and osteoradionecrosis of the jaw secondary to medications. This should alert and support the fact that an ounce of prevention is much better than a pound of cure when it comes to complications. If every patient 
that is diagnosed with a malignancy of the head and neck, and specifically for our topic today, oral cancer, sees a dental provider and has a complete examination with elimination of fossa of infection and correction of any dental issues. Uh, ideally, all of these should be coupled with oral hygiene instructions and equipping this patient with fluorinated supplements and occasionally with mouth guards that will help with the x-ray scatter from radiation therapy, they can have a preventive effect in the patient and also aid in compliance and also not inter interrupt treatment if any of these complications occur. And uh, let me show you some examples of these. So serostomia is probably one of the most common ones, especially related with radiation therapy to the head and neck. And patients are going to experience the dryness, either as sticky saliva or dryness, or just difficulty with functioning. Their reflex is to usually just sip water every minute or two. And we have anecdotally found in our patients that it works much better if they simply chug the water down like every 30 minutes or every 60 minutes and follow that with rinses of oil, usually olive oil or um, coconut oil. In Guatemala, when I was uh, back there, people would take a little piece of lard and put it in their mouth and use it as a lubricant. So the sequence should be stay hydrated, make sure that the, the water is in there for hydration of your plasma, but also follow the hydration with lubrication, and that increases the, the comfort level of patients dramatically. Candidiasis is a problem that occurs very frequently when the mouth mucosa is dry and everybody knows how to treat candidiasis. In the oral cavity, usually the fluconazole or coltrimazole or nystatin is uh, required to be used a little bit longer than for vaginal infection. So if you're trying to extrapolate uh, OBGYN protocol for vaginal candidiasis, it's not gonna work as well. In the oral cavity, the transit time of, of the saliva is faster, plus sometimes there's not enough in serostomic patients. So, we usually treat patients for this for two weeks rather than a couple of pills here and there for OBGYN. And another important thing is to make sure that if a patient happens to have a dental device that has plastic or acrylic in it, you need to make sure to treat that, that device as well, either by soaking it in a solution of nystatin or using, uh, if it has no metal, a diluted bleach solution. Uh, I messed up these slides. These are upside down, I guess. There was some facial hair that didn't give me orientation. But in any case, mucositis is the other thing that happens, and it can be transient or usually uh, related to chemotherapy, and radiation therapy can also give you that. This is a very debilitating thing that sometimes makes patients stop treatment temporarily. But um, radiation caries is also a very big thing for patients. Obviously, I'm showing you some advanced cases here, but... This is what we can prevent in, men, in many of the cases. If we equip these patients with oral hygiene instructions, we remove any foci of infection from their mouth, we allow for healing, and ideally if there's extractions or anything that needs some surgical procedure of the dental alveolar complex, those should be completed at least uh, before the simulation of radiation. And hopefully, if everything goes according to plan, they should be completed two weeks before. And, I, uh, and make sure that there is re-epithelization of that mucosa to allow for sealing of that, of that mucosa from the bone. Medication related to necrosis of the jaws is usually a late complication of patients that underwent chemotherapy, especially with inosumab, but there's many other agents out there, usually related to poor response of the maxillary bone or the mandibular bone to the healing demands of after dental alveolar trauma or taking a tooth out or putting an implant in, in an irradiated field, I'm sorry, in this case, in a, in a patient that has low vascularity and low osteoclastic activity secondary to the medications. So here's a list that we're gonna leave you with. It's in your handout of the medications on the left that are, have been associated with medication-related osteonecrosis of the jaw. And remember that in this case, old patients, in, in all of the cases of oral head and neck cancer, they should be seen by a dental provider before the beginning of treatment and during the, the treatment for maintenance and after for maintenance. Also, speech pathology, dental hygienist, and um, physical therapists can also be of help. And that is one of the things that team, uh, teamwork is going to increase the outcome of your patients.
Gentlemen, thank you all so much. This has been very informative. Uh, this is the time at which we go ahead and ask our audience to go ahead and submit questions. So just a reminder for all of you, uh, if you already uh, answered the poll at the beginning, you can just start texting if you're on a phone or typing. Uh, if you're at a computer, your questions. And as soon as those show up, uh, we'll go ahead and, and start answering those. Uh, if for some reason you did not join, oh, there we go. Uh, but if you didn't join at the beginning, you can just text uh, 22333 with the letters UNCCN. You'll join, and then you can go ahead and, and do the, uh, the uh, submit your questions. Uh, did he say HPV positive men is a better prognosis or worse? The, uh, the, Dr. the limited data that's out there would suggest that when patients are HPV positive for oral cavity cancer, in men, they have a better prognosis. In women, the HPV does not change their prognosis. This is basically observational data. So HPV positive oral cavity cancer in men have a better prognosis than on the non-HPV positive cancer in the oral cavity in men. All right, thank you. Uh, we do have a question about the handout. And if you go to the, the website, uh, unccn.org, and go under events to this event, you will find uh, a variety of different pieces of information, including the handout and a link to the recording uh, that will be available. The same link uh, for the live event will be available for the recording. Uh, do you believe the concept of HPV-associated oral cavity cancers is new, or did researchers just recently learn what, the, uh, what to name it? If a new concept, what's, and I'm, I, I'd, I'd encourage whoever uh, shared that question, if you go ahead and share the, the remainder of it in, a, in, a, in an additional text. It's uh, HPV positive, as Dr. Patel had pointed out, cancers are, are primarily studied in the oropharynx, uh, and that's where the lion's share of the volume of, of HPV positivity has been seen. Many institutions, including UNC, are now uh, routinely performing HPV testing on all of our specimens, oral cavity, larynx, hypopharynx, and the oropharynx. That being said, the number of cases that we see in the oral cavity that are virally driven, as Dr. Badia pointed out, and the number of cases we see of HPV positivity in the larynx are still very, very low. And so there, were, there have always been patients who have received cancer diagnoses without tobacco alcohol use. And it might be that we are now seeing that some of those patients were virally driven, but it by no means is a large proportion of the population. All right, thank you. Are you just, can, can, oh, I, yes, can I please. quickly add, uh, so what Dr. Hackman is saying is also something to remind you that in the oral cavity itself, as defined before, the, the percentage of HPV-driven cancers that have transcriptionally active HPV 16 or 18 is about 4% at most. So it's, it's not a significant number of patients that have that, but yeah. it, it does exist. Mm -hmm. And then the ones that are in that category follow the, the prognosis that, that he was saying. All right. And, and uh, are you distinguishing that from HPV uh, pharyngeal cancer? Very different. Very different. And uh, Dr. Bia probably can address that, that line in the middle. My thought process is the place that sometimes gets most missed is along the upper buccal mucosa posteriorly behind the maxillary tuberosity. That's an area that, that can be very difficult to see at times. Um, that's an area that I find I see patients who have lesions that have been there for a while. So posterior, superior buccal mucosa behind the tuberosity is an area. That's correct. And um, from the perspective of finding the lesions, sometimes we get a little compliant in, in watching. Uh, the trend now is to recommend to jump into a biopsy earlier, as long as you have eliminated any potential sources of trauma or any irritating factors or any disorder that you feel is diagnosable through your clinical evaluation, go ahead and biopsy. And if I can put in a little plug for my pathology friends here, um, please, when you biopsy, make sure that you <clears throat> include a slight little bit of adjacent mucosa because now we have to measure the depth of the tumor, not the tumor thickness, and the eighth edition of the AJCC manual calls for a plumb line from the adjacent normal mucosa to the deepest portion of the, of the tumor, and that can only be measured if we have adjacent mucosa. So please do uh, uh, um, include a slight little bit of adjacent mucosa in your biopsy sample. And when you do biopsy, please go ahead and, and at least include five millimeters of thickness because we need to report that as a prognostic and treatment guidance for uh, oncology teams. There's a question about your 
uh, the dry, how to reduce dry mouth symptoms they didn't hear? Oh, want. I'm sorry. Uh, so for the dry mouth patients, one of the things that's important is to make sure that they are well hydrated, not enough that they end up with hyponatremia, but well hydrated. And when they do drink their water, the anecdotal evidence that I found with my patients is if they stop sipping all day long, when they sip every time that they do that, they wash away the mucosa or the mucus lining in the mouth, and that gives them the sensation of dryness and, and discomfort. It also allows for uh, scraping of the mucosa against the dentition or devices. So when they stop sipping and they just chug their water down, that's much better. Plus, they should follow every time they chug, they, they sip the water, they drink the water with a swish of olive oil or, or coconut oil. This swish is not very pleasant for some people, some more people don't mind. But it's important that they do it for at least 60 to 120 seconds because the more it coats that mucosa, the longer it's going to last and it's going to make the patients more, more, much more comfortable. Think of it that the oil is an emollient and it won't evaporate, but water will. And so I have, I have my patients fill a, take a bottle at Walmart, one of those mist bottles that you used to use for air fresheners, for your mouth fresheners, and they fill it with grapeseed oil. It's less astringent than the olive oil. And they can even walk around in the day and they mist their mouth with a little grapeseed oil. And then at night, if they take some coconut oil and rub it on their lips and their gums before they go to sleep, it keeps their mouths more moist. With respect to the question at the bottom of the screen about biopsy, not every lichen planus lesion or all lesions need to be biopsy. A small four millimeter white spot can be followed. I think when you start talking about larger lesions that have a lot of surface changes, there's height to the lesion, there's depth to the lesion, um, those are ones that we're probably more likely to biopsy. A, a single solitary five millimeter white patch is probably okay to follow as long as you're willing to see that patient back and see them for routine examinations. If there's any erythroplakia, if there's any bleeding, easy like friability, those do warrant a biopsy, but a benign white patch that's small and stable can be followed as long as you're willing to be the person that follows them. Okay. Well, I've also seen quickly on that, those oral like implants lesions fluctuate in patients um, and their symptoms. And so I've been fooled where I've you know, I thought there was cancer. I sent a frozen section from the clinic. I've got CAT scans. It's all negative. Only for that lesion to come become cancer ultimately within a few months. So, you know, six week follow up. And once they've been treated, if they have good dental um, follow-up, I sometimes like I combo the, the follow-up. If not, then it's kind of clinical, you know, whether it's every six weeks, every month, every two months, but it's, it's a close follow-up until I think I see things stabilize. Okay, I, I do apologize. We are running out of time or, or actually over time. Uh, I'm so thankful to our audience for being here uh, and for the great questions that have been coming in and to our presenters. Uh, I do want to, this is important that I mention the evaluation and credit for today's program. In order to receive credit for today's program, you must complete an online evaluation. So uh, individuals participating in this lecture uh, and group viewing locations, see your site coordinator for instructions. Individuals participating via GoToWebinar, you will receive a GoToWeb, you will receive an email through GoToWebinar one hour following the conclusion of the lecture with instructions and a link for that evaluation. So one way or the other, please do that evaluation for credit. Following the completion of the evaluation, those seeking ANCC and that's the, the CNE credit, the ASRT credit, or general participation certificates will be able to print and save your certificate. CME certificates and ADA CERP letters of credit will be sent via email within two weeks of the lecture. I do want to thank uh, the UNC Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center, uh, the North Carolina General Assembly for their generous support of the UCRF, or University Cancer Research Fund, and the UNC School of Dentistry. In particular, I want to thank Mary King, Veneranda Oborre, and Alan Brown for all the hard work that they do to make this and all lectures possible. Uh, questions, follow up with us at 919-445-1000 or unccn at unc.edu. You'll find a wealth of information there, including all of our recordings. Uh, oh, I think we're over 200 now, and we'll be adding this recording shortly to the collection in our library. Uh, Dr. Padilla, Dr. Patel, Dr. Hackman, thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Thank you.